Now, before we begin, let's bow in prayer, please. Father, we take a moment to calm our minds. There's much going on as far as what needs to be done later today. Let's put that aside. Things that need to be said to other people here before we leave this morning, let's put that aside for a moment. Because I know I'm excited to see people I haven't seen in a while as well. And let's invite you to come into our hearts, into this, into this room. We'd also invite your spirit to be there for comfort for Susie, Peggy, Tom Paulo, Mike Paulo, Jane Paulo. Please give them comfort. And we also think of Pastor Bud and Ann. We'd ask that you would give them a time of relaxation, a time when they can recharge their batteries, and also that you would protect them because Pastor Bud speaks the name of Jesus Christ as the only name under heaven under which one may be saved. That's what this church stands for. That, that puts both Pastor Bud and Ann up for attack from Satan. So as a church, we pray that you would protect them. And now speak to us this morning. That's why we've come. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's all kinds of sales techniques that are used in the marketplace. And I'm sure that several times a week you get phone calls, all kinds of phone calls with people who want your money. I get calls from people that say, if you just purchase this ninja food slicer, we'll send you the Samurai's Cheese Cutter for free. All it's going to cost you is $50. I'll say, no, 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 I don't. And I don't need the samurai cheese cutter. No, thank you. I'll get calls from the NRA. They always want me to send in a donation. And they'll say, if you send us $50 right now, we'll send you a pair of special commemorative Charlton Heston fingernail clippers. Would you like to make that donation right now? And I'll say, no, 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 thank you. If you'll join our organization at this time, we are going to put you in a drawing for a fully restored 1975 Ford Pinto. It's a classic who wouldn't want one of those? No, that doesn't work on me. Another thing that's used are what they call compliance techniques. I think I've mentioned these before. Somebody may come to your door and they'll say, I'm here because we think utility bills are too high. Would you sign on this petition to say that utility bills are too high? And you say, well, yeah, I'll sign. Well, I'd like to pay less. So you sign your name. Then they say, do you know, since you agree with our our position here politically, because we're going to submit that petition. I don't know, but I kind of doubt these petitions get submitted. Then they say, would you like to make a $25 donation? Well, if you don't make the donation, doesn't that make your signature kind of invalid? So it's a real sneaky technique. And I'll say, no, don't want to sign, don't want to give money, thank you, goodbye. The next one, and I'm sure you get one of these a week. Hi, this is such and such and so and so. Would you like to donate $500? And instantly you go, <laughs> and you say, no, no. And they'll say, oh, well, I know, it's, times are tough. And then they'll ask what they really want. They'll say, would you make a donation of $50? See, now that's what they're really after. But they figure it's going to be too hard for you to say no a second time in a row. I actually, for entertainment in the house, put the telephone on speakerphone and talk to these people. The last one I had... I'm sitting there, the whole family's listening, and I'm going, oh, you want me to get 500? No, I am not prepared to make a financial donation. And then they said, okay, just make a $50 donation, at which point I said, that's a compliance technique. You never even wanted the $500. You just wanted the $50 donation. I know what you're doing. Click. Bzzz. And then we all laugh and have a good time. But you know, all of us are suckers for something. You want to know what I'm a sucker for? Before and after, I am a sap. Bill Phillips, a while ago, had these books, Body for Life. And it's filled with before and after pictures. This is what I looked like before Body for Life. 
I weighed 250 pounds and I just had no muscle tone at all. And now, after drinking this noxious stuff that he sells, buying the book, I feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, you give me something like that and I just roll over and say, okay, where do I sign? Before I can do that. And then he even has the book. Now, if you buy this book too, Eating for Life will show you how to eat so that you can look buff and clean in just five weeks. Five weeks. I can do that. All of us have those little areas that we fall for. Before and after. That's what makes the Biggest Loser TV show so popular. It's a before and after. And you've all seen the Nutrisystem ads with Marie Osmond there. Now, don't those catch you? I guarantee there's going to be one in your Sunday paper today where it shows Marie Osmond. And if I could say her voice, says, here I am at 50, and I've gotten all the way up to 165 pounds. And you know the picture where she's wearing that kind of drapey dress, and you can tell she's put on some weight. And I really like Donnie and Marie. And so, you know, she says, but I went on to Nutrisystem, and look at me now. And it shows her real skinny. And she says, I'm now 105 pounds, and I feel great. And she's kept it. And I say, wow. So sometimes that really gets me. And I'll say, see, it's possible. But you realize that not only are there before and after stories, there are also stories that are before, after, and then. After, after. And the after, after isn't so good. How many here remember Oprah? and her big weight loss. How many saw her bring the little wagon of cow fat out on the stage and say, look at all the weight I lost? And she looked marvelous. And I mean, it was a little Red Rider wagon just piled up with cow fat to show, this is how much weight I lost. And even I sat there going, wow, Oprah, I'm pretty good. And I realize I'm in jeopardy of losing my man card for saying that I watched an Oprah show. So <laughs> for the men out there, I. I Please forgive me. <laughs> but Oprah gained it all back. Something wasn't right there with all the motivation. And there was a before, after, and then an after, after. It was too tough to keep all that off. Kirstie Alley is another one. She, you know, her first movie debut was the Star Trek movie. I said, who is this new actress? Then after a few years, gained a lot of weight, then decided to lose the weight, went back to where she looked before, but it was so hard to sustain. And now she's just said, this is who I am. I don't care. I, I, I'm angry at all those programs. You know, I'm just going to be this. I hate this. It's too much work. Do you know that same pattern of before, after, and after, after sometimes hits the child of God, the believer in Christ? We might call it sin, repentance, and then, oops, fell back. Something happened. He fell back. It's happened to me. I bet it's happened to everybody in this room. Usually happens with something where we have a crisis situation. It's like, oh, God, get me out of this. If you just get me out of this, I will, I will never lie again. God, if you just get me out of this, I will never get caught in that sexual situation ever again. Oh, God, if you get me out of this, I, I will never, I'll never tell another story about another person ever again. I didn't know that these feelings would be hurt. I will never, I'll keep my mouth shut forever. I will never gossip or repeat anything. God, if you just do this, I will never take anything that is not mine again. That was steep. I will never do it again. And then for a moment, with that crisis repentance, there's a season of obedience. Then what I see many times when it's a crisis situation, a year later the person is back to where they were. Do you ever wonder why that happens, how that happens? What breaks down? There's before, after, and then a very unwanted after, after. This morning, we're going to look at Jonah chapters 2, 3, and 4. And we're going to see that same pattern of failure in Jonah's life as we sometimes see in our own. Before, 
after and after after. And we want to examine that breakdown in Jonah's spiritual life so that we can avoid making the same mistake ourselves. Maybe a mistake that we're involved in at this very moment. So if you would please turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah, that is in your Old Testament, one of the 12 minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Pretty much right in the middle of those 12 books. And just briefly, we are going to review Jonah's before. We talked about this about four or five weeks ago. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. But Nineveh was the home of the Assyrians who were Jonah's enemies. He says, I don't want to, why would I want to talk to them? They deserve death and judgment and punishment. They should be wiped from the face of the earth. I am going the absolute opposite direction. I will not do it. And he ran away, got on a ship. The ship was was racked with a horrible storm. They were throwing everything overboard. Finally, they cast lots to see whose fault this was, and the lot fell to Jonah. And he said, yep, it's my fault. I have disobeyed God. And he says, you know what you're going to have to do to save yourselves? You are going to have to throw me overboard. And that's what they did. And a lot of people read that, and they say, wow, Jonah was so brave. He was thrown overboard to save all those people. No. Oh, that wasn't bravery. Jonah was essentially saying, I am so against this thing that God wants me to do, I would rather die than obey. Throw me over. And they did. Guilty? Yes. Was he scared? Yes. Was he angry? Oh, yes. Repentant? Not a bit. He could have said, Turn the ship around. I will obey. And I believe the storm would have calmed down. But rather than say, I confess my sin, I am wrong. He said, throw me over. I'd rather die than do this. Not that any of us would ever say, I'd rather die than admit that I'm wrong. Then Jonah had and after. He had a time when he did repent, and that's where we're going to start in at Jonah chapter 2. And we're going to see where Jonah prays a prayer of repentance. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. From inside the fish, apparently there's enough of an area where he can breathe. And if any of you have ever fished and cleaned fish, you'll know you will find air pockets in fish. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountain, I sank down. The earth beneath bared me, barred me in forever, but you brought my life up from the pit. Oh, the, oh, Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you at your holy temple. I mean, we're talking distress here. He figured, this is it. I'm going to die. And as I read through this, I came close to drowning in a river once in 1983, and the whole description here of being thrown into the deep, the current swirling about you and being sucked down under the water, you cannot breathe. It is fearful. It is the only time when I was brought back into the boat. In my life, I remember being so afraid that my knees knocked together. Absolute terror. I thought, this is it. I am going to die. And so Jonah is in a crisis situation. Fear. And then in verse 8, Jonah prays, Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And I read that and I say, Well, now I've seen fear, and he's really focused on how afraid he is. And now verse 8, maybe he's thinking of the Assyrians. Maybe we have a vision here of Jonah getting in the right focus of what God wants him to do. And he's realizing that, 
okay, these people in Nineveh, if they don't hear about God's grace and obedience to him, they, they could all die. Then we come to verse 9. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. And then the next couplet. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Do you like the sound of that? In terms of a repentant prayer, in terms of spiritually getting your heart in line with what God wants, do those words sound good or somewhat tenuous? What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. I don't hear, I have sinned. I don't hear, I am wrong. I'm not seeing, I am ashamed of what I've done. Lord, I have sinned against you and you only, and I am ashamed of what I have done. No, I don't hear that. I hear a man who's terrified. And then a man who sound, says something that sounds like, Lord, if you do this for me and get me out of this situation, then I will go to Nineveh. Sounds to me like he's cutting a deal. Don't we all do that from time to time and think it's repentance? Oh, God, if you get me out of this situation... I, I promise, never again, never, I just, please, if this can be kept quiet, and just, if this situation at work can blow over, I made a bad mistake, I don't want anybody to find out, this could jeopardize my future, if, if we could just let this go away, please. Don't we like to cut deals? Not really repentance, cutting a deal. And some of this is normal. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, in her book about the five stages of grief, talks about five stages that anybody goes through in a crisis situation, sometimes death, loss, a serious thing that attacks a person, and the first thing, the first step is denial. Nothing happened, nothing happened, everything is as it was, this can't be happening to me. The next is anger, this is happening to me. I can't, I, no, I don't want this in my life. Next is called the bargaining phase, plea bargaining. If this will just go away, and a lot of times a person will supplicate to a higher being. Christians will pray to God and say, if you can just make this go away, God, then I promise I'll be better. I'll, I'll do this. After that comes depression, and then many times acceptance follows. But this is noted in psychological texts, not as repentance, but as a typical human psychological progression of thought. It really doesn't have anything to do with handling sin, handling an offense against one's God. Well, let's see what Jonah does with this. Verse 10 of chapter 2, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And then we start in chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now this is kind of nice. Jonah gets a second chance. That doesn't always happen in the Old Testament for a prophet, but here he does. I'm certainly glad that Jesus made it clear how second chances work with us. In Matthew 18, 21 through 22, when Peter said, Lord, if somebody offends me, how many times should I forgive him? Up to seven? Jesus said, no, try 70 times 7. 490 times the whole force of the text is saying, you have to keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and giving people second chances. Jonah was getting a second chance. We get second chances every time we come to Christ with a sin problem. 1 John 1, 9 says we have infinite forgiveness there. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. 
Jonah gets a second chance. And God says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And you have to give that to Jonah. He obeyed the word of the Lord. What I have vowed, I will make good. You want me to go to Nineveh? I'll go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be, Nineveh will be overturned. A message of judgment, the end is near. The message was of God, and he was saying, because of your evil, something bad is going to happen. And then God does something amazing. He gives Nineveh a second chance. Verses 5 through 6, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation, which we'll talk about in a moment. But these people fast. They put on sackcloth and own their guilt. This man's right. The word of God has come to us, and it's, it's talked about our, our worship of idols, how violent we are. It's right. We are guilty. What? We're guilty. Now, when you think of repentance, sackcloth and ashes, I doubt anybody here has ever put on sackcloth and ashes. In my entire life, I've only ever seen one person sit in ashes and dust. And you know what's coming, David. <laughs> Doug Jensen and I wouldn't let Dave Jensen be in the Challengers Club once even though he went through all the requirements and jumped off the tree branches he was supposed to. And David, right in that little alley between 3rd and 4th Street, when you go up Clover, sat down on a rock and took, took cinder dust and poured it all over his head. <laughs> sat there crying, and Doug and I were so hard-hearted. We just passed and went... <laughs> <laughs> Doug and I apologize. That was terrible of us. But thank you for the illustration. <laughs> Dave was crying. He was in the midst of sorrow. I mean, he felt terrible. That's how the Ninevites felt. Terrible. We, we could be rejected of God. We could be destroyed. We, we're on the outside. We want to be inside. Whatever it takes to get back into a relationship with God. Now, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, sat in the dust put on sackcloth? Now I'm seeing something that looks like real movement of the heart, real repentance. And then it goes on in verse 7, the king issued a proclamation in, in, in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. That's ownership of sin. I am wrong. I am guilty. We as a nation are wrong. We as a nation are guilty. How long has it been since we've heard somebody call our nation to prayer? Last I can remember, a real focus on prayer was after 9-11, when President Bush called on us to pray. Then I go back to the years of Reagan, where we actually had the year of the Bible. We really emphasized days of prayer. Here, the leader said, everybody, sackcloth. Everybody, fast. Now, just between us, when's the last time that guilt over sin has made you say, well, I'm not going to put on sackcloth, but I'm not going to eat today. I'm going to fast in repentance because I, I feel such shame before God. 
I will fast just to show him how serious I am. Ain't that not often? Not often with me. I read this and I say to myself, what is wrong with you, Mike? You see this? You don't view sin that way. You'd rather cut a deal. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This teaches me when there is true repentance, approaching God with an attitude of, I am wrong. When there's a degree of guilt and shame, it touches God's heart. When there's a a sense where we reach up to God with faith and say, there is nothing I can do. I am helpless before you in my sin. I I turn from it. I'm, I'm getting an idea of how you see this. He has compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. God relented. Now God used Jonah. He used Jonah. What would it be like if God called you to go someplace to a city of 120,000 people, you walked through it for three days, and the entire city converts and repents? Has Billy Graham ever done anything like that? One person, one man, one woman could walk through a city like that. Wouldn't you say afterwards, if you saw how God used you, wouldn't you sit down and go, you'd fall on your knees, oh, Lord, I'm, I am not worthy to be used like this. Thank you for using me. You'd say, the Spirit of God used someone like me. There would be, I would think, such thankfulness. And the thought, this ministry has been a success. And I'm thinking, Jonah should be rejoicing. He should be saying, God, thank you for how you've used me. But that's not the case. Jonah has fulfilled his vow. He's obeyed the Lord. He went to Nineveh, but he's worse. He's not rejoicing. We're going to see where he has gone from before to after In chapter 4, he's in after, after, where the worst, the last state is worse than the first. What we're going to see is this is like a stain. You stain your clothes and forget the stain is there, throw it in the wash and figure it's going to come out, and then you throw the article of clothing into the dryer. And once it's gone through the dryer, what happens to the stain? It's set. Something about the heat, drying the stain onto the cloth, not letting some type of a laundry agent work into it to break the chemical bond down. The stain becomes set. And so it almost looks like this is what's happened to Jonah. Chapter 1, he's angry and bitter. Chapters 2 and 3, he cuts a deal. There's repentance and a form of obedience. And then chapter 4, he is angry and bitter. And Jonah slides back into his old mindset. And here we hear Jonah's complaint in verses 1 through 3. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. And you say, what is going on here? Why would a person after a successful ministry and God uses them say, I'd rather die? The man is in that Kubler-Ross stage of depression. That has nothing to do with repentance. The man is depressed, and when you are depressed, if you have ever dealt with depression or another person who is depressed in your life, you'll know all they want to do is sit in the dark and either sleep or think about death and just getting rid of the pain. I want it to go away. Whether I sleep it away, whether I drink it away, whether I take pills that make it go away, or whether I die, I don't care anymore. I I, I just want everything to be over. 
trying to motivate somebody who's dealing with depression. It's tough. It's satanic. And even Jonah's attitude here, without the Holy Spirit changing people's heart, does this help you understand why there will never be peace in the Middle East? Different tribes there have hated each other for millennia. The thought that we will go in there, aside from the Messiah, Jesus Christ, coming back at the end of the tribulation and saying, this is how it's going to be, there will be no peace there. It illustrates to Jonah, I think, a very ugly part of his own heart. And if God is active in your life, you will be able to say, he's shown me some ugly parts of my heart. I take care to make sure I look good when I come here Sunday morning. I take my shower, I shave, I dress nice, press the shirt, put on a little smell good. But you know, we all realize there are ugly, sinful parts of ourselves we hold on to. Jonah then probes Jonah, uh, God then probes Jonah in verse 4. The Lord replies to Jonah, have you any right to be angry? Jonah goes and sulks. Jonah went and sat down at a place east of the city. He's not even responding to this. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He's waiting to see. The man is sitting there saying, maybe I'll get lucky and God will change his mind and destroy them anyway. After, after is a bad place to be because it makes you think you repented when you didn't. It makes you think that there was an issue where you actually approached God and dealt with sin, but you didn't. You tried to cut a deal. Jonah tried to cut a deal. You and I try to cut deals from time to time. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Then God probes him again. But God said to Jonah, verse 9, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? And Jonah shows how he is set in his anger, in his depression. I do, he said, I am angry enough to die. And this is what depression gives. This is after, after. God has the final word. Verses 10 through 11, But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend to it to make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? God's final word is spoken here and it's essentially what he says in Ezekiel 33, 11. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. No pleasure in it at all. But Jonah is unmoved. So when we look at this, we can see that when it comes to repentance, repentance, it's not plea bargaining. Repentance is not cutting a deal with God. So if you think, you know, you've cut your deal and somehow God hasn't come through because you're back in sin, it's because repentance never really happened. You did something, but it wasn't repentance. You do not approach God like he's Monty Hall and say, let's make a deal. It used to be an old game show. For those of you who are 40 years old and older, you may remember that. And repentance is not a temporary change based on fear or anger. 
There's a story about a man who, who bought a parrot as a pet. He went to the pet store, got a hold of the parrot, said, I would like to buy this for a pet. Brought it home with him, set it up in its cage, and then found out that parrot had a bad attitude. Not only a bad attitude, but a sailor mouth. And this parrot just had the most terrible things to say. Hated the man, bit him all the time, would just say, oh, go away from here. Just terrible words from the parrot. The man was really ashamed to have anybody over because the parrot's language was so horrid. One day, and the man tried everything to reform the parrot. Played soft music, always spoke to it in nice soft tones. Come on, come on. It's okay. And he'd put his hand in there, and then wham, he'd get nailed by the parrot. One day, he was at the end of his rope. He said, we're going to try again. Opened the door of the cage, put in his hand, come on out. The parrot nailed him on the finger, and the man grabbed the parrot, started to shake him. The bird's quack, quack, quack. I said, oh, this is the end of it. I'm putting up with this no more. You're going to have some time to cool off, buddy. And he took the parrot, opened the freezer door, threw the parrot into the freezer, and then shut the door, and then just listened to the bird in there going, quack, 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 quack. Then it got real quiet. He thought, oh. I hope I didn't hurt the bird. I hope it's okay. So he goes over and he opens the freezer door. There's the parrot, all quiet. Puts out his hand. The parrot jumps onto his hand, crawls up and says, I have been terrible. I have spoken to you unkindly. I have used terrible language. And I am sorry I was that way. I am going to change, and I'm going to be a new parent. I will never speak to you that way again. The man was, and as the man was about to ask the parrot what changed his mind, the parrot looked at him and said, um, may I just ask, what did the turkey do? <laughs> Fear won't bring about repentance. Fear will not make a permanent change. What repentance is, is when you say, I did wrong, I am wrong, and my heart is broken. Do you know 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow brings repentance? In my storytelling, I knock the top off of this. If I don't put it back on... Godly sorrow brings repentance. And you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There is something right about being afraid of God, but it's the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of a relationship with him, not the end of it. Because in the end, we approach God and we want to have a relationship with him based out of love, and perfect love casts out fear. I think that as one becomes closer to Christ, one is able to approach him not so much in fear, but with love and respect, <laughs> love and honor. And I think that the qualities of honor and respect overtake the fear. But fear is just the beginning. You don't start a race and sit there in the blocks and when the gun goes off, just sit there and run in place. No, you run towards the goal, which is a relationship with God that will be based in love. In any way, do you feel hardened in your walk with Christ? Stalled out, limping along? Could it be that just like I have found myself at times in after after, you are in after after? And that's why there's something that is stalled out. God's not come through for you in the way that you want it, and you are mad about it. You are angry. And you are angry enough to die, angry enough to call it quits, and sometimes it's everything you can do just to come to church because you're saying, I don't know why I do this. It's mostly just to see my friends. God isn't coming through for me. Maybe it's time to rethink how you approached God. Did you approach him to try and cut a deal? Or did you approach him and say, 
I am wrong. I must change. That's what repentance is. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, for myself, it's time for me to rethink. For all of us here, it's time to rethink. Holy Spirit, examine our hearts. Examine my heart. Have I been cutting deals with you? Have I been giving you little ultimatums? I want you to do this, and after you do this, then I will give you my obedience. Then I will obey. It doesn't work. That's not what repentance is. Father, maybe this is where we need to ask you to show us what's in our heart and bring to us godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow brings about repentance, and repentance brings about salvation. And then it says, and that brings about no regret. No after, after. But 2 Corinthians 7.10 also talks about worldly sorrow. And that yields death. And I think worldly sorrow is depression. And depression comes from trying to cut deals with God when God wants our heart, not a deal. He wants humility, not an opportunity to, to bargain. Father, if we have been trying to bargain with you over sin, I'd ask that this would be the day we would say, enough. Father, build into our hearts a sense of godly sorrow so there can be true repentance and growth so there can be no regret. It's in Christ's name we pray.